Good afternoon and welcome to the High Noon Club. Glad to have you with us today. Appreciate you coming out. And uh, no, Bob is not here. Paul is. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. We're glad to have you with us today. We're going to do our normal. We're going to stand and have a word of prayer. And we're going to say a pledge to our American flag. And I've asked Brother Jimmy to lead us in prayer this morning. Father God, thank you for this great meeting. And this is a Friday highlight of a lot of our lives as we look forward to cleansing our nation of the evil that runs in and streams around our states. We thank you for this meal and bless the hands of Target and, and give us travel protection on our way home. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. Jimmy's a good friend and an old friend, not because he's old, but because I've known him a long time. So. <laughs> pledge to the flag. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can have a seat. I'm going to present to you Mr. Gary Bands, and he's going to talk to us about the Oklahoma Honor Flights. How many of you know what the Oklahoma Honor Flights are? How many in this room have been on one? There we go. Good. So he's going to tell us about that and, uh, and introduce us a little more information about the Oklahoma Honor Flights. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor for uh, my wife and I to be here today to share this uh, with you. Uh, it's a little bit of unnerving uh, to, to get here and uh, to be told that uh, the time's going to be cut short. I, I was a public educator for 28 years. And uh, when I left the classroom, the class periods were 85 minutes long. And so I'm kind of accustomed to... You can keep talking, we're just all going to It's like, like a pastor I had one time, he said, uh, he said, you get through listening before I get through speaking, just feel free to get up and work. So we'll kind of use that approach today. Uh, it's always an honor for me to share uh, what it is that we're doing, particularly with the Oklahoma Honor Flight Program. But it's also an honor for me to uh, to be anywhere where any of my colleagues are willing to be there and listen. So, <laughs> Representative Wesselhoff, I uh, appreciate you being here today. And uh, Representative Lewis Moore was here a few minutes ago. Uh, you might want to add to your uh, concern list or your prayer list. Uh, Representative Moore and his family, his mother has been hospitalized and uh, he needed to uh, be excused and go uh, spend some time with her. So, we'll keep, keep he and his family in, in our thoughts and prayers. A couple of you have asked me uh, for an update uh, on a program that we had uh, three or four weeks ago here. Uh, a man by the name of Lou Marin was here with an organization called I Am American. And the subject of the uh, conversation that day was the use of Article 5 of the United States Constitution as an approach to uh, roll back an out of control, unresponsive federal government. Uh, and some of you have been interested in what uh, the status of that issue is with regard to the Oklahoma legislature. And I'll just share with you briefly, uh, we've got more conversation to, uh, to occur before we're ready to uh, present that for a vote in the Oklahoma House. Uh, I'm disappointed, not discouraged. Uh, I'll just kind of leave with that. We started the legislative session uh, this year with uh, 20 states needing 34 to uh, come together with resolutions before Congress. Uh, there have been three more states added, uh, Ohio, Georgia, and uh, Michigan. I'm sorry, there were 20, and uh, Georgia, Tennessee, and Michigan have been added to date, and there are several others that are in various stages of, uh, of the legislative process in their respective states. I will tell you, just as a matter of point of reference, in Tennessee, in 2012, Tennessee rescinded their open call for an Article 5 Convention of the States, 2012. We're in 2014. They became the 22nd state to re-engage with a 28 to 0 vote in their Senate and an 89 to 2 vote in their House. So in other parts of the country, it's catching on a little more rapidly than it is here. Um, Oklahoma may never join. I, I don't know. 
I know that if we get to 34 states, we're going to want to be a part of the conversation. So uh, we've got to engage at, at that point. So it's a and, and uh, the conversation, uh, as, as uh, some have asked me, and I, I simply respond, the, con the conversation continues. <clears throat> we're here today to share with you the Oklahoma Honor Flight story. Let me give you some background briefly and then talk to you about what happens on a flight. And uh, then I would like for my wife to come and share a couple of things that have been a follow up as a result of the trips that we've taken, let you know what we have done to this point and uh, where we're headed with regard to this particular program. I was elected along with Representative Wesselhoff in 2004. Uh, we uh, are in our 10th session. Uh, finishing our fifth two-year term, and both of us intend to stand for re-election uh, for a sixth and final term uh, in the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Uh, two weeks from this week, uh, yesterday actually is the end of filing period, so we'll kind of know the, the lay of the land and the landscape uh, after, uh, after the next couple of weeks in terms of what we're going to see this fall for the 2014 election cycle. The first two years, one of my assignments was, uh, committee assignments, was the Veterans Military Affairs Committee. At that time, I was asked to be the vice chairman as a freshman, uh, and that was the first uh, time that Republicans had taken control of the Oklahoma House since a two-year period in the early 20s. Um, the next election cycle in 06, the uh, leadership asked me to take the position of being chairman of the Veterans Military Affairs Committee. Same thing in 08. Uh, in 2010, uh, we were asked to chair the Rules Committee, and Representative Wesselhoff was the chair of the Veterans Military Affairs Committee. And then in 2012, uh, they asked me again to chair the, the uh, Veterans uh, Committee. It's not a committee that gets a lot of activity legislation-wise. There are not a lot of bills that come through there. But uh, I would, I would suggest and advance and support and defend the position that it's a pretty important committee. Because we don't get a lot of legislation and we're not out front on a lot of issues uh, that pertain to the veterans, uh, we were always looking for ways to shine the spotlight on our veteran community. And in 2004, May the 29th, this was prior to the time when I was elected in the fall of 2004, I got my father and four brothers together, five of them, not the band of brothers, but the band's brothers, <laughs> and we were present at the national dedication of the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. <coughs> They all served in the Navy in the South Pacific. All were still alive at that point and able to travel. And we had a small family reunion in Washington, D.C. in conjunction with that weekend and its activities. I say small, I've got 32 first cousins on my dad's side. So <clears throat> we had an unbelievable time together as a family. It was a very meaningful experience. I couldn't help but reflect My grandmother, who had ten children, five of them deployed somewhere in the South Pacific, facing each new day as that sun would come up over that South Central Kansas farmland and that golden grain of wheat waving in the wind, and wondering what went through her head and through her mind and through her spirit as she went to the Lord each morning in prayer for her five boys. And not unlike you, wondering when they would come home. There were 16 million in uniform in World War II. We were a nation at war. It impacted everyone. Even if you didn't have somebody that was mobilized or on active duty and deployed, 
your family was impacted by the shortages that were created by the war. And so rationing took its toll collectively on the mindset of our nation. One of my friends from Tinker Air Force Base says, uh, you know, we're today, we're at war. I assume everybody realizes that. But he characterized it this way. He said, we're a, we're a military at war and a nation of them all. That's where we're at today. That's where we are today. Back then, everybody understood the nature of what it was that was at stake. That was in May of 2004. In 2005, a national organization got its start. It was called Honor Flight Network Incorporated. Because the World War II Memorial was built six decades after the service of the people it was honoring, for most of them who were still with us, it was easy. They were not going to see that memorial or be able to experience it unless somebody acted upon their behalf. And so a national movement was started. And we were a little slow coming to the table. Fast forward. I get elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives. I'm asked to serve in this capacity, looking for ways to shine the spotlight on our veteran community. In 2008, my father was asked to participate in one of those flights from the state of Kansas. October of 2008, I watched as he was able to participate in that activity and understood the impact that, had, that that had on him. Even though he'd already seen the World War II Memorial, how the dynamic came of, of that small group of South Central Kansas World War II veterans, how, that came, how they came together on that, on that event and the impact that it had on them. And so I began to ask the question, what are we doing in Oklahoma on behalf of our World War II community? And discovered we weren't doing anything. So I contacted the national organization, got a response back. They told me that there were a couple of gentlemen in Tulsa, a man by the name of Earl Lay and a man by the name of Don Folletti that had contacted them and gave me their information and I got a hold of them and said, what, what are you guys doing? What, what's been done? Uh, and we had a conversation, uh, but nothing really in a formal way had, uh, had come together. About that time, I received an email from a constituent. And the email basically said, my father, a retired colonel from Tinker Air Force Base, and has been given an opportunity to join a group out of Dallas to go to Washington, D.C. with a group called Honor Flights. What are we doing in Oklahoma? And I said, uh, we're not doing anything that I'm aware of right now in a formal sense, but we have been asking questions. We've been making some plans and preparations. And she said, and my father is, uh, my, uh, my husband is gonna go and assist on the flight as a guardian. What can we do to see that uh, that kind of opportunity is given to our Oklahoma veterans? And being the proud people that we are, not wanting Texans to take care of our Oklahomans, <laughs> <laughs> that put us in fast forward and we solicited from the national organization the information we needed and began to work on the steps that would be needed to stand up an organization in Oklahoma, be recognized as a hub to operate in conjunction with the national organization. And in September of 2009, we completed that process, were given that recognition, and began to tell our story, and began to hold out our hand 
and ask Oklahomans to get on board to help us with this effort. We took our first flight in May of 2010. Ed Vesey was one of our veterans on the first flight. Ken Bartlett has served as a guardian on the second, third, fourth second. flight, second flight. Let me tell you what we've done. Each of those flights are a charter flight. They seat 168 people. Miami Air is the charter of choice. They've taken us on each of our flights. Each flight costs us $100,000. That's a lot of $50 donations, Paul. Actually, you don't get there with $50 donations. I'm just here to tell you. We took that first flight. We we made we made the uh, decision as a board to not commit to an operation until we had the resources to make it happen. There's something connected there to the Republican approach to finance. <laughs> but Oklahomans began to respond in a very generous way. My wife and I run this operation out of our home. I'm the executive director, I'm the co-founder. We serve with a very distinguished group of folks from the Middale area primarily, who serve as boards of, on the board of directors. We stand on the shoulders of a lot of folks to make this happen. We have a volunteer committee in Tulsa. We took one flight out of Lawton and we stood up a volunteer committee out of the Lawton area to help with the details of the flight. As you can imagine, uh, putting together a flight with 168 people, at that time on the early flights, the first 11 flights, we were taking over 100 veterans and about 60 to 65 guardians to provide the supervision and assistance. A very fragile group of folks. About a third of them, 90 years of age and over. We take 50 wheelchairs. Um, it's quite a challenge. But from that very simple beginning, May of 2010, on our first flight, first two flights actually left from the uh, tarmac at Will Rogers uh, uh, on the guard side before we were able to negotiate agreements with uh, air carriers over at Will Rogers and get the zero grade entry for our veterans into the plane. May of 2010 was our first flight. October of 2013, we took our 15th flight. 15th, yes. We've taken 1,433 veterans to Washington, D.C. To see where we are. That would not happen without an enormous response from all over Oklahoma. We have four flights on the flight schedule for this year. Our next flight goes out of Tulsa, April the 30th. Our next flight out of the Oklahoma City area, Dallas City, and Oklahoma City, is June the 4th. And with those two flights, we will, we will finally have addressed all of the applications that we've had on file as a backlog of our World War II veterans. The day we started, the day we were recognized, the national organization sent me a packet of 105 World War II veteran applications. And we got up to where at times we had between five and 600 World War II applicants on our waiting list, and we just couldn't get to them fast enough. Again, we weren't going to take a flight schedule until we had the money in place to make that happen. And I could spend about 40 minutes just telling you how uh, the miraculous ways that, that the support base has come in. I don't know if you've computed that in your head yet or not, but uh, we will have raised, by the end of this year, we will have raised some, somewhat just under $2 million. Wow. Not one dime has gone to pay anybody's salary. Everything that we have raised goes to underwrite the cost 
of communicating with and working with the veterans and the guardians and then the costs associated with getting them there and back. Let me tell you real quick what we do on a day trip. It's a two-day event, really, and we uh, there's too much teacher left in me not to incorporate the teachable moments for our next generation. But we have a send-off event the night before the flight where we pair up each of our veterans with a student escort. Normally, they're junior ROTC kids from our local high schools or Civil Air Patrol or young uh, airmen and officers from Tinker Air Force Base for the flights that go out of Oklahoma City. For the ones that go out of Tulsa, we have utilized the Thunderbird Youth Academy, which is a state organization, I mean, which is an organization that's run under the uh, military, uh, the National Guard and the Adjutant General's Office in the United, of the Oklahoma Military Department out of prior. But we hook them up with a veteran for the evening as an escort. We ask school children to write letters to these veterans. Now, today you can keep in touch with your deployed relatives and friends with Skype or with email. And even though the distance is there and the separation is there and, it's, and it's, it takes its toll, it's not like it was in World War II or Korea or Vietnam where you're isolated in a way and you might not get mail for two or three days, four weeks. Mail call became, was a very important, significant time in the life of a deployed soldier. So we get school children all over the state to write letters to these veterans. And as a part of the uh, program on the day of the flight, uh, we present each of these veterans a packet of letters from school kids, school kids thanking them for their service at a time we call mail call. Pretty emotional deal for these guys to receive that and go through the uh, information that they get from students. The send-off event shines a spotlight on our veteran community. It's open to the public. We'll have anywhere from 900 to 1,000, 1,200 people at Rose State College Communication Center at our send-off events. The ones in Tulsa occur at uh, the Bixby, in Bixby at the Spirit Bank Event Center. <coughs> we pair them up with these young people. They come in under a saber arch and are seated next to the veteran in special seating arrangement in what we call the Parade of Patriots. My wife introduces each and one of them individually as we project up on the screen the hometown, the branch of service, and the name of each of the veterans that have been selected to go on that floor. And we challenge them in a little ceremony we call the exchange zone ceremony, in, in which we relate or challenge them to think in terms of a relay. The most critical part of a relay race is the exchange of the baton. The lane's pretty narrow. It's not very long. The exchange happens at high rates of speed. And that's where, frankly, the disaster is most apt to occur in a relay race. You can have a lot of individual uh, speed, but the gold medal usually goes to the team that masters the exchange. And that's not unlike what we experience as a nation. For us to survive and thrive, we have to understand the values, the traditions that have made our nation what it is. And those have to be transferred to the next generation successfully or we're in trouble. So we have a coin that's been, a commemorative coin that's been created especially for that exchange ceremony. The student has the coin. The veteran is given a pocket-sized copy of the Constitution that they took the oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend. 
and the veteran reaches out and hands this to the student, accepting the coin in a handshake from the student in an exchange. We board the plane the next morning early. We leave Midwest City about 4.45. Get out to Will Rogers, go through TSA. We try to be wheels up around 7 to 7.15. We normally taxi away from Will Rogers with the uh, fire department giving us a water cannon salute. We arrive in Washington or in Baltimore, BWI, to a water cannon salute from the fire department at uh, BWI as we come into the terminal. We're greeted by volunteers and usually a band uh, as we get off of the plane, board our buses. We have United States Park Service Police escort from Baltimore for the 45 to 50 minute ride down to the memorial. Everything stops as our caravan comes through and takes our precious cargo to the World War II Memorial. We normally get there about 12.30, 12.45. We spend an hour, an hour and 15 minutes or so at that site. We load everybody up, take them to the other end of the mall where we give them another hour, hour and 15 minutes to visit the Vietnam, Lincoln, and, and Korean era or memorial memorials. We load up there, go across the river, have an appointed hour at changing the guard to the unknown at Arlington Cemetery. From there, we'll stop at Iwo Jima on the way out of Arlington. <clears throat> From there, go to the Air Force Memorial where you have a, a kind of a vista look out over the district <clears throat> and the Pentagon. From there, get on our bus, do kind of a windshield tour back out of the district, back to Baltimore, go through TSA, get on a flight, get home about 9, 9.15 that evening. It's a very long day. It's a very challenging day. But everywhere we go during the day in the district, didn't happen on the first few flights, but the last, the last ones we've had, the last eight or 10, we have that United States Park Service Police Escort. Red light and siren in front, red light and siren behind. And if you want, if you want to know what it, it's like to experience being in a motorcade like that on the rush hour traffic leaving DC, going back to Baltimore, and literally the traffic parts like the Red Sea, and we straddle that white line, the dotted white line in the middle separating the two lanes, and we never miss a beat at 45 miles an hour as they get out of our way going back. And the guys that are on the lead bus get the best view, but that's quite, a, quite an experience for our veterans. And it's on that portion of our day and that portion of the flight day that we have the mail call uh, where we distribute the letters to the veterans. Let me share with you one quick experience that we had and then I want to introduce my wife and let her share with you some of the things that we get to enjoy as a follow-up with that and I will be happy to answer specific questions if you'd like and talk about a couple of other programs that we've done to expand our footprint, if you will, here in Oklahoma. It was the June flight last year, I believe. We had a, we had a man from Meeker, who was one of our veterans, and the guardian who was accompanying him that, on that flight was also from Meeker. And we have a donor that uh, has graciously accepted the challenge of uh, not only funding entire flights, but has uh, made it possible for all of our veterans who live very far away to come in the night before to the send-off event and then stay in Midwest City in the hotel where we leave the next morning. And then when we come back that evening, uh, they can stay in the hotel as well so that they're not getting in their car late at night after a long day and trying to drive home. But this gentleman decided, because they live in Meeker, which is fairly close, out 23rd, they decided to go on home. That evening. They had made arrangements, they weren't staying in the hotel. Now for us, it's a two day marathon, literally. Uh, two 23 hour, almost 21 to 22 hour days. 
So they're, they're long and, and, we'll, and we take them on Wednesday. So Thursday mornings, it's not common that either one of us are going to be up very early. <laughs> but the phone rings about 9 o'clock that next morning and Linda happened to be the one that rolled out and took the call. And it was this veteran from Meeker. And he, he let into her. He just couldn't believe what a day they had had. He thanked her and thanked her and expressed appreciation and went on and on and talked about how meaningful it was and what they got to do and all that. And, he, and then he kind of said, you know, we were just minding our own business going home last night and all of a sudden we looked up and there's a red light behind us pulling us over. And that officer came around and he wanted to know who we were, what we were doing out this time of night, where we were going, what our business was at this hour. And he said, we just told him, we're World War II veterans. We have been on a trip of a lifetime. We've been in Washington, D.C. We've got to see the World War II Memorial, the Korean Memorial, the changing the guard, the tomb of the unknown. <coughs> officer, you can't believe what we've done. It's been the trip of a lifetime for us. And frankly, officer, we're accustomed to that light being out in front of us. Instead of behind us. <laughs> he said the officer thanked him for their service and told him to slow down and to get on home. <clears throat> Linda is the point of contact with all of these veterans and their family members who go as guardians and those who are not family members like Ken who are selected to go as guardians and provide the assistance and supervision. She has a very unique role and a very unique relationship with all of these folks and literally they're from all four corners of the state. And she has a little different perspective and I would like for her to come and share just for a moment uh, a couple of the things that uh, are uh, examples of what we get in the terms of follow-up after, after one of these flights. And then I'll, we'll be happy to open up to questions and we'll go from there. Thank you. I want to share just a couple of, um, of appreciation notes from uh, family members. Uh, as you can imagine, it is a life-changing thing for the veterans, but um, we believe our ministry is uh, equally as important to family members, and, uh, and we are grateful for that opportunity. This first one is from the wife of a veteran who went with us on a Tulsa trip, and uh, um, his nephew went as his guardian, but she just wrote the thank you letter for both of them. Uh, Neil and I appreciate so very much all you did to make his honor flight a tremendous experience for him. He and I were married in 1946, right after World War II, but he never talked about it. I never asked about it, thinking he would talk about it when he was ready. And so it was exactly that way. He saw the movie, Saving Private Ryan. And he said it showed things as they really were. I can't stand to watch those kind of movies. <clears throat> he was in the Battle of the Bulge, that coldest European winter of 1944. He was pinned in a foxhole filled with icy water overnight. By morning, his boots had to be cut away because of his swollen legs and feet. A conservative surgeon in the Army Hospital in Oxford, England, saved his feet and legs, but they remain purplish red and painful to this day. Anyway, the honor flight seemed to give him a release that he had never had. He was so pleased to get to go and make it, he was always trying to go sometime and this was it. He enjoyed uh, the visit and you did an excellent job of planning and following through. He still talks about the trip with no glitches. That's, that's not quite true, but they don't see the glitches. 
<clears throat> we really like for sons to go with their dad. Uh, part of our mission is to uh, help communicate and educate the next generation. Or sometimes it's grandsons. But often it's a son, and often the sons are Vietnam veterans. And in order to go with their dad, they, they pay $500, even though we need to be honoring them as well, and we do. But uh, they understand what we are trying to do while we still have time for the World War II guys. This is from an attorney in Oklahoma City who went with his dad uh, last summer. I've gotten a few nights sleep and had a chance to reflect on the honor flight trip, and I wanted to let you know how much it meant to my father and me. My dad is like a lot of other veterans on that trip. They were called to duty, and they went without question. When one thinks about how dire things looked at times for Europe and Asia, it's not a stretch to say that these men and their fellow veterans saved the world for democracy. It's a very different world now than it would have been without them. The amazing thing, and probably the reason they've been in the shadows for so long, is that they didn't seek recognition for what they did. They served out of duty to their country just as they did for their communities and families when they returned home. My dad did not have to explain to me what it meant to be a responsible member of society. He showed me by example every day, just as most of those veterans did. That's why I'm so grateful for what you've done with Honor Flights. When I realized everything each of you did to honor these men, I am amazed. No detail was left out and no effort was spared. And it was for a bunch of guys you did not know they never see again, and for no reason other than to show them honor and respect. You took a lot of risks with a group of aged and somewhat infirm men just to be sure they got the recognition they deserved before they passed from this earth. I witnessed the true meaning of loving your fellow man, and I'm humbled by it. I can tell you it made a difference to my dad. He was impressed with Washington, but his heart was really touched by the people who shook his hand, patted him on the back, and thanked him for what he had done. In a way, they were thanking him for everything he has done his whole life out of that same sense of duty to country and family. He was uplifted by the entire experience. It was a unique and unbelievable gift you gave to my dad, and I can never thank you enough. P.S. On Thursday morning, as Dad headed home, he was still wearing his honor flock shirt and hat. <coughs> I tell uh, our guardians in our guardian training that uh, uh, like people don't have dictionaries anymore, but if, pretend you still use a dictionary. <laughs> uh, and if you looked up the word insanity, uh, our picture would be there because we are taking 80 to 100, 85 to 96 year old people on a day trip halfway across the country. I think that qualifies for insanity. But I just want to tell you a story that I don't know why, but this one is, is uh, become my favorite one. Uh, this was from the September 2012 flight. And I will call him Mr. D. He was 91 years old, and if they are 90 or older, when they send in their application, they go to the top of the list. So I had notified him and confirmed that he could go. I had sent him a letter. It was about uh, maybe seven or eight days uh, before the trip. and. Um, I got a call from Adult Protective Services on behalf of Mr. D. I'm sure there's more to the story than I will ever know, but um, just real quickly, he and his wife lived in an assisted living center in the north part of Oklahoma City. He in assisted living and she in the memory care unit. And uh, he had fallen 
had been hospitalized, had surgery, been in rehab, and now was in a skilled nursing center. And he was very upset because um, he had not been able to see his wife in several weeks. He was used to going to visit her every evening, even though she did not know him, helping her get ready for bed. And apparently he made enough uh, fuss about that, that the assisted living or the, the skilled nursing center called Adult Protective Services to act on his behalf because there was not any family locally. So I uh, visited with the young man and I, he had come across our um, letter to Mr. D and I explained what all that was going on and, and um, uh, we needed to get some more pieces of the puzzle filled in. I called the emergency number that was on Mr. D's application. It was not a family member, it was a home health care nurse that had become very close to him. And when I called her, she said, oh, I, I just fell in love with him. I told her what we were doing, and I, I said, we need, some, we need some help. She said, I can't go as his guardian. It was too short a notice for her work and family obligations. But she offered to go to the skilled nursing center and pick him up, of course he was in a wheelchair, and bring him to the send-off ceremony and then take him back that evening. And then the skilled nursing center would bring him to the airport to meet us the next morning at 5.15. And that's the way it happened. But in my conversation with her, I said uh, he didn't put very much on his application about what he did in the war. I said he, he put platoon leader, paratrooper. And I said, what, do you know any more about what he did? And she said, oh my, she said there's a frame in his room. He was dropped behind enemy lines at Normandy. He has a bronze star and a silver star and a purple heart. Mr. D got to go on the September 2012 trip out of Oklahoma City. And two months later, I read his obituary in the newspaper. It's our privilege to, uh, to be a part of this. If you would like to pray, uh, I'd like for you to put April 30th and June 4th on your... Uh, we need lots of prayers. And you can understand anything like this has lots of moving parts. We are just two of dozens that make this happen. And then the Lord fills in lots of gaps. But it's our privilege to be a part of this. Thank you. Ready for questions? We'll take some questions. And okay, I, yeah, I'm going to matter the questions, and I, I want to finish up by explaining what the Operation 4G stands for up there on that, and, and we'll we'll use that to, to wrap up. But let me speak to the areas. Of questions, and I'm going to break the rules today. Uh, you don't have to ask us a question if you want to make a remark or say thank you to these folks for what they do. We're going to allow that today. Questions, Paul. Representative Bands, the, uh, the gentleman that have made application and are waiting for the flight. Do you know how many of those unfortunately passed away before they had the opportunity to go? Uh, there's no way to measure that, but that happens on a routine basis. The question was, well, I guess everybody can hear what the question is. But, but that happens all too frequently. Uh, especially when we had uh, five to 600 people on our waiting list. Uh, there's about 120 World War II guys that that are on our list right now that we're going to get on these next two flights. We will complement, we will fill the plane uh, with Korean era veterans whose applications have been on file for two years or more. Uh, or more. Uh, and then flights this fall will, will cover the World War II applications that come in between now and then. 
and then uh, we've got about 170 uh, Korean era veteran applications currently on file, and those two flights will accommodate that. We don't know what is beyond that in terms of the request by application. Uh, we do have these four flights uh, underwritten as far as uh, we know where the money we think is coming from, uh, so we, we feel comfortable making commitments to those. But uh, yeah, that, that's very, uh, that, that's one of the downsides. And for Linda to be able to call, because we're there on the waiting list, and as, as they come up, and she called and she said, oh, uh, that passed last Thursday, you know, or whenever. You know, that's not a, that's not a good message to me. Richard, is there any chance that you could change your schedule and do a two-day event versus a one-day event so it won't be so stressful? And fly the guys out uh, at noon time, put them up in the hotel, and bring them back the next day. Sure. Great question. When we, when we stood up the organization and evaluated the approach that we were going to take, uh, we contemplated all of those kinds of scenarios. The flight rental on the plane for the day runs about eighty to eighty-five thousand dollars. If we were to stay overnight in Washington D.C. for a hundred and sixty-eight people and add three more meals for a hundred and sixty-eight people, it would really drive the cost just almost out of sight. Uh, I will tell you, even though it's a long day, when they come back. There's nobody sleeping. Now, they're worn out. They're taxed in terms of uh, the, the physical challenge. But they're, they're running on adrenaline. And, and it has not been, it has not been a, uh, I, I say not been. There have been a, a few occasions where people have declined to go because they didn't think they could meet the rigor of the, and the demands of the, of the day. But not many. Uh, that's just the approach that we've taken. Uh, to maximize the donor dollars that we do get and stretch them as far as they will go, and we have avoided that. Now you don't appreciate this, but those of us who have our name on the line and are insured as boards of directors, there's an element of risk there then as you extend that over a two or three day period and you've got the application of medications and all the regimens that a hundred veterans of this age are going to have. Uh, that just complicates things even more. So we, that also was a part of trying to, <clears throat> to draw it down as tight as we could and, and make it happen uh, on a one day time. We're about as far west as you can get and get there and back in the same day. We give them breakfast on the plane going up. We have dinner on the plane coming back. Uh, that, that's a great question. I, and most, there are a lot of other hubs around the country that do make it a, a more than a one day event. But they don't. They haven't taken 15 flights. They haven't taken near the number of people that we have. We could do that, but we wouldn't have been able to reach as many as we've been able to reach in the short amount of time that we've had to do that. And frankly, uh, the reason we don't have to, to beg and claw for resources is because people understand the sense of urgency that's associated with the window of opportunity closing for us to act on behalf of these these veterans. And it's not all just men. We've had a number of women that have gone. Will this eventually encompass Vietnam vets as the time moves along? Or is, this, is there an end in sight to this, this that, program? That is a decision that will be made by the board. Linda referred to the Vietnam era veterans. Uh, we haven't gone back and we haven't made it an attempt to count the number of, that, that's me, that's my generation. You know, I was drafted during the Vietnam period. So it, we've, we've actually uh, made that trip possible for a number of, of Vietnam era veterans and I don't have we could go back and, and look at, the, at those who would have fallen in that category. We will take care of the Korean applications that we have on file. Beyond that I'm not sure. The hub is established and the national organization has transitioned into flights accommodating that. It becomes a much different environment in which to raise the resources and the revenue to support the flights when you get down to where it's exclusively a Vietnam, and that's not right, but it is what it is, and it becomes much more difficult to raise the revenue uh, to support those. So that board, that, that's a decision the board will make uh, down the line yet. I'm Maggie, and I had never heard of the honor flights before until during the so-called government shutdown when barricades were placed. Um, 
at the suggestion of the administration around the sites to be visited. Do you have any uh, any yeah. information about or experience sure. with that? Uh, yes, that impacted us directly on our October 2013 flight. We were scheduled to be there October the 8th, which was a Tuesday, and uh, the uh, the shutdown occurred the Wednesday, Thursday before. And so that's that was the coverage that you got on national television of, I can't believe it was uh, Minnesota or Michigan, one in the upper Midwest and Mississippi hubs that were there, and of course uh, uh, the confrontation that, that was there. Uh, our flight schedule was just enough later that some things had been worked out, and we actually, we actually left here with a United States Park Service police uh, permit in hand, granting us access to the World War II Memorial and the other, the other sites. Now, as a, as a, as a parting uh, poke. And everybody still, they begrudgingly granted those kind of, that kind of access, but they kept the water feature turned off and they kept the bathrooms closed. So oh, no. we, we, we had access to it, and I, I don't have time to show it to you here, you can't protect it up there. But, uh, my father got to go on that flight. We had an extra uh, seat uh, that turned up on that. Uh, that's another story into itself, but my dad was with me on that, and uh, I've got a picture of my dad and I standing behind the barricade with the sign on it there, uh, that that's representative Wesselhoff. That's uh, the extent of my social disobedience on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The picture was taken by the Park Service police guy. <laughs> 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 uh, on that. But we, but uh, uh, we, we were able to do everything that we normally do on a flight. Uh, we just did not have access to the Park Service Police Escort because they were not operating, but there was no traffic. The government shut down. You know, there was no traffic. We didn't experience the kind of congestion that we you normally would have. Arlington wasn't impacted at all. Uh, when we went down to the other end of the mall for Korea, Lincoln, and Vietnam, they had the barricades across the base of the Lincoln Memorial. You couldn't go up the steps and up to Lincoln. You could stand there and take pictures of it. But the Korean and Vietnam memorials were open to us. We just moved the barricades, took our caravan in, put the barricades back when we left, and went on about our business. Well, you know, in Arlington, the residents there use a lot less water than they do over at the memorial. <laughs> That's true. So, do you want to do this Operation 4G? Would you like me to bring that up on yes, the screen? Yes, that would be fine. Uh, Operation 4G stands for giving to the grounded greatest generation. We're rapidly arriving at the point where we're not going to have anybody that's going to provide an application anymore to go on one of the flights. But we're still going to have a number of World War II veterans among us. They need to be honored as well. So some time ago we came up with this idea of giving to the grounded greatest generation. Those who will not go, cannot fly by doctor's orders or whatever, the state of Oklahoma has seven long-term care facilities set aside exclusively, populated exclusively by war veterans. People who, to get into them, you have to have, uh, have had uh, service in one of the defined war periods. <clears throat> Lawton, Norman, Claremore, Clinton, uh, Sulphur, Tallahena, and Arden. Those are the seven. And we have high concentrations of World War II veterans at all of those centers. So we began some time ago uh, uh, going to where they are. We take the honor flight program to them. And I have on display up here, what there's a bag. Inside of the bag, uh, we, we put a, uh, a copy of a book entitled The Jewel of the Mall. It's a pictorial, it's a nice coffee table edition of of uh, the development of the World War II Memorial. They get a hat, they get a light blanket that's got a mountain flight deal on it. They, they get a coin, we, we still hook them up. We, we essentially try to duplicate the send-off event from the night before the flight at one of these centers. And uh, uh, that, they get that whole bag full of, full of stuff in the exchange. They get the letters and, and all of that. And again, it, it's a very meaningful experience to the families and to the people of those communities. And we have now, we've 
we are going to reach between 475 and 500 more World War II veterans uh, in, in that program uh, that are not actually going on flights. But uh, we, we call attention to their service and honor them uh, before it's too late where, where they live. We've already done the one at, uh, at Lawton and Norman and Claremore and Clinton. And next Friday, week from today, we're in Sulphur for the one in Sulphur. And then we'll have two more that probably we won't get to until the summer after the legislative session's over at Ardmore and Tallahassee. Uh, but this is where you can help us. Two things. Number one, if you know a World War II veteran who is still able to travel and would like to make that trip, Linda's got applications here online to our website and download a copy of the two-page application, get them to fill it out, get it sent in. Uh, they go to the top of the list quick. They, we've got September and October flights, Tulsa and Oklahoma City, where we can still uh, get our World War II guys in. Help us find the World War II veterans. And then secondly, if you know of a, of a long-term care facility that you have contact with that has, that you think would have high concentrations of World War II veterans particularly, uh, make us aware of those. We'll put them on our priority list. We're going to go to our state-sponsored veteran centers first, but then eventually uh, when we stop flying, uh, we have the potential of continuing the program a little while longer uh, to honor these World War II guys where they where they live. So I would simply uh, leave those two requests and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity today to share this Oklahoma on, on the flight story and, and uh, you've been a great audience and, and very attentive and uh, we appreciate uh, the support that I know you'll give us. Well, thank you. Mrs. Vans, would you join your husband for just a moment? Uh, I want you to know that from my heart People across this country talk about the Oklahoma heart through all the disasters where we've sent people to help and they see us around, but this is Oklahoma dealing with Oklahomans, dealing with Oklahoma veterans. And I want you to know that I appreciate that and I would like for our high noon folks to give you our appreciation and applause for both of you. liberty and what we do is to help honor those that have led the way and it's an honor for us to do that thank you and we appreciate that very much thank you for being here join us again next week for high noon 12 o'clock high noon i know people ask me all the time what time <laughs> it's high noon it starts at 12 o'clock so be with us next week and thank you for being with us today